So are you having fun? Yeah, it's been some great messages. I've been listening in the background, and I've been so inspired by everything that I've heard, and I've learned so much that I'm thinking, oh, I want to add this, and I want to take this. And so I, I decided I would just start with a question. So I have a question for you. How would you define legacy leadership? Legacy-minded leadership. I mean, we're a group of leaders, right? Some of you are teacher leaders. You lead from the classroom and beyond. Other of us, others of us have more formal positions of leadership. Maybe so there's some uh, department heads and some different people doing different kinds of things. If we were to take legacy back to your local context, if we were to look from the places you lead, how would you define it? What is legacy-minded leadership? Now for me, when I think about legacy, and maybe for you, it's easier for me to apply it at home. When I think about legacy, I think about my kids, parents, maybe my estate, loved ones, that kind of thing. And what kind of legacy am I leaving there? Other people, they actually think about legacy using it synonymously with inheritance. So maybe it's about what do I leave behind when I die? Part of what I hope to do today, though, is to share with you a little bit about the vast difference between legacy-minded and inheritance-minded, especially the way that it plans out when we're talking about leadership. I mean, inheritance is easy, right? Any of us can leave an inheritance. We might leave an inheritance that, you know, to the ones that we love and to the, you know, our family members. And inheritance can be some, any kinds of things that we're going to leave, but it's tangible. It's short-lived. It has a shelf life. But legacy, you don't just leave legacy to your family and to your loved ones and to your colleagues. You leave legacy in your family, your loved ones, and your colleagues. Legacy-minded leadership. When you're leading from a legacy perspective, your vision is much bigger than your tenure at your school. You're thinking about, what am I going to leave behind long after I've, I leave the tenure in the role that I'm playing? Legacy-minded leadership is culture shift. It's where your vision is so big that you are transforming the lives of those that are under your leadership. So legacy-minded leadership is transformational leadership. It's really where you're thinking about, okay, transformational leadership is going to be where I am going to make such an impact that my best work, my future ready work, will be evident and it will be visible long for generations to come after I leave the school. So you measure the activity that you're involved in behind, is this truly leadership or is this simply management? Am I managing the status quo or am I leading and taking us somewhere that we need to go to have these students, to have my colleagues, those in my sphere of influence, future ready? So I've had an opportunity to really think about this idea of future-ready leadership. And not just from a techno-constructivist perspective, like I usually approach things. Typically, when I'm speaking to audiences, or I'm writing, or thinking about the things that I do, it's very much tech enthusiasm, assertions. But I've had an opportunity to unpack future-ready leadership from the perspective of empirical data, looking at the research that's out there and grounding it in the ideas of others. The United States Department of Education actually invited me, the Office of Educational Technology, to be part of a project that we worked on together. I was to help design and lead this work that was going to challenge superintendents across the United States and individual leaders like you and me around this idea of being future ready leaders and leading digital conversion or digital transformation within our schools. In doing so, we put together quite a team. I had the opportunity to work alongside the American Institutes for Research, and we started this work, this Future Ready Leaders work, by developing a rubric, pulling from all the research that we read, deciding what does this look like. And the rubric helped to design and helped to uh, guide and align the stories that we collected from the different districts that we went and visited. We also brought in Primary. Now this is where the fun began. Primary is a video production company that's very different than the videographers we typically have in school. Primary is based in LA, and they're known for their work in creating commercials for companies like Google, Starbucks, um, Vans skateboards, and Vans shoes. It was very interesting when we hired them. Their client list was so amazing, but it turned out they were 25 and younger. The head of the company was 20 years old. So you can imagine, I've got these crazed, wild artists 
who are coming into these schools and they're wanting to capture these stories in very different ways. And then I've got these very stodgy researchers who want to make sure that you know every T is crossed and every I is dotted. And it turned into this wildly wonderful kind of project. What we decided we would do is we built a uh, interface that is a self-assessment tool. And then what you do is you sit down, you take a very short self-assessment, and based on 50 videos that we created that are about three to four minutes long, it generates or spits out this customized playlist of videos for you to watch. Now, the most interesting thing about the work that we did was that it, um, it isn't like showcase. You know how a lot of times when you see videos from different schools or different, different um, groups talking about their work, it's very much showcase, it's the best, it's the greatest, we're going to look good kind of stuff? What we did is we worked very hard to get these people who are demonstrating future-ready leadership, these superintendents and other district leaders, to talk about what didn't work. What, what were your failures? What was your best failure? And those kinds of questions. So the, the videos become very mentor in their capacity. Now, the exciting thing is that all of this is going to launch in November, and it's publicly accessible. So you'll be able to use the tool, I'll be able to use the tool with, in the places that we lead and the work that we do. What I'd like to do is tease you a little bit with a trailer so you can kind of whet your appetite so that you can see where we're going. But before we do that, let's talk about the rubric. The rubric has four main domains that surfaced as we did our research. So you can see it's collaborative leadership, personalized learning, robust infrastructure, and professional learning opportunities. So these are the four main stays of where future-ready leadership needs to lay. So as you're thinking about your legacy-minded, future-ready vision, you're going to think about which bucket does it fit in. And then underneath those, there were different dimensions, 27 in all, where we sort of unpacked each one of these big domains, these pillars of future-ready leadership, looking at what does it look like. And then as we got the stories, we'd take like 10 hours of video from a particular district, and we'd go through and build the content so that it perfectly aligned with the rubric that was there, which was, was very, made the, the messages very powerful. So let's take a minute and look at this, this trailer. I do want to say that Future Ready Leaders, the work that I've done has changed me as a person. It's changed who I've become. And that's really important. My, my work that I spend doing now is very legacy minded. And I hope that it'll have the same kind of impact on you. Relationships is the key to any kind of change initiative. People have to trust you and you have to trust the people. That means spending time with them. That means soliciting input and getting to know what their feelings are. You know, we talk about in order for change to occur, there has to be a significant emotional experience. If it's not emotional, you're not going to change. People recognize that learning is not linear, and there are times when you get in the flow of a new idea or concept, and you really go at it. We want to recognize that burst. If you simply disseminate information and ask students to regurgitate it on a standardized test, that in and of itself absolutely will not prepare students for the problems and the challenges that they're gonna face in the 21st century. Equity is an important issue. We have a superintendent who said often, your zip code should not dictate your educational opportunity. And we all believe it. This leadership team believes it and we've done everything we can uh, to support that equity. One way to get equity is access to technology, frankly. We can change culture, we can change the environment, we can provide a holistic education, we can use technology and the best teaching practices and the best curriculum to really transform this school community and transform the lives and futures of every student that comes through our district. In order for it to be effective, it has to be collegial, it has to be ongoing, and it has to be job-embedded.
It was so great. I don't know if you noticed in there the scene where they looked like they had a table and they were operating and they had a garment over. Um, as we were doing the videos and capturing, that was actually a leg dissection in one of the high schools. They brought in a cadaver and they died, they put, took it off at the uh, thigh. And then what they did is they did reconstructive surgery on the knee with all of those students. That's who was there taking them through it. And of course, we were all blown away. It was a real learning experience for us to be able to see this. I don't know. Maybe you guys are around cadavers, but I'm not much, right? And, and so we, they shot a lot of video of it. And so as I went through the edits, we had to go through like six edits and I had to keep saying less leg, less leg, because <laughs> they kept showing so much of this leg because it was such an incredible experience for these kids. So I want to ask you, you know, what is your future ready vision? You know, what are you thinking about? Are you willing to lead digital transformation in your schools that are, that are preparing the most elite kids to be able to attend the best colleges? Are you willing to lead a digital transformation with a legacy-minded, future-ready vision to, to the groups that you work with? I want you to think about that over the next 10 minutes or so. There will be a test. I'm actually going to do a call to action at the end. So be thinking about what it is that you might have, your best work that maybe you're doing now or that you really would like to kick off and you would like to think about in the position and the places that you lead. So there are four pillars, and we'll go ahead and see if any of these four pillars will inform your future ready vision. We're going to start with collaborative leadership. You know, traditionally, when we think about leadership, we think about leadership from the perspective of formal role-based power, right? You're in a position, you're put in a position of leadership, so you tell those that you're leading to do things, they do it, and they get a paycheck. Very transactional. You know, where we think, we tend to think about leaders lead and others follow. But when we're talking about collaborative leadership, it's transformational. And in transformational leadership, by contrast, that's where we put together a collective group of decision makers and we take them through the process, in this case leading digital transformation, by empowering them to learn and lead. So what collaborative leaders do is they build thick leadership density in the folks that they're working with. They say, okay, educators, what we want to do is we want to help you understand how to lead from a place of excellence so that part of your role as a leader is actually building that leadership inside others, capacity building, helping them to self-actualize. I, I got this great story for you. So I was, I went, I remember way back, and you'll have to go way back with me, when I was first applying for my first teaching job. And I went to a job fair, and I was sitting down in front of the interviewer, and I was actually interviewing for a very prestigious district. It was the best in the state. I was living in Georgia at the time. I was in Valdosta doing this job fair. And I said, you know, what I want to do is I want to, I want to give them my best shot. So I sat down, and I remember telling this interviewer all about how I saw education, the things that I saw needed to change in education, where the flaws were, what I hoped to bring about, how I was going to leave a legacy in education and make a difference one kid at a time, through passion-based learning, and it would start in my classroom. And I'm going on, and he stops me. And he says, can I say something off the record? And I said, sure, what? What do you want to say? And he said, no principal is ever going to hire you. I was taken aback. I was sort of aghast. I was like, what do you mean? I was the education darling of my teacher preparation program. Of course they're going to hire me. And he said, no, I'll tell you the truth. Principals want teachers who follow the rules. We don't want people that make waves. The principals want teachers who are basically yes men, who will teach the mandated curriculum. They don't want visionaries that are willing to change education. That's not what they want. Ah, oh, see, this is the problem. The problem is, is that most schools, independent schools or public schools, home schools, that most schools don't embrace this idea of distributive, collaborative, transformational leadership. Instead, what they do is they come in with standardized agendas of what they want teachers to do and to perform. And what we found was is that kids, if, if given that kind of empowerment, can collaborate together around their passions or around the teacher's passions and produce wonderful solutions to prob authentic problems and challenges. See, it's a very powerful thing, the way that we think about this idea of collaborative leadership. I had the great privilege of working under Greg Anderson. I was in a school that had a very diverse kind of environment. We served the most elite uh, 
parents that had their houses or homes right on the beach, because I live in Virginia Beach. And so these kids came from very powerful uh, parents who knew exactly what they wanted for their kids. And then we also had the greatest number of kids that were homeless, because when you live on the beach, what happens is in the winter, everybody uh, piles into the hotels because the rates drop, and the hotels encourage that. And then as soon as summer comes, all these homeless kids go live in their cars with their parents. And so it was very interesting dichotomy. Greg knew with circumstances like that, he he was going to have to be a capacity builder. He was going to have to help his staff, his very challenged staff, to self-actualize. And so what he did is he told all of us, I want you to make decisions out of the, with out-of-the-classroom initiatives to help our lowest performing learners. And so I decided that I would create a curriculum, a very innovative, passion-based kind of curriculum to do that. When I sat down and talked to Greg about it, he said, you know, I don't know that that's going to work. He said, um, what I want you to do is I want you to really think deeply about this because I'm not going to have time to help you lead it, I help you design it, and I'm certainly not going to have time for you to help you get teacher buy-in or to help the, you get commitment from the teachers who are going to have to learn something new. But because he trusted all of us, and we all made important decisions that impacted not only students, but impacted the school as a whole, he believed in collaborative leadership. And it really took us to a place of this personalized learning, which is the second pillar or construct of future-ready leadership. Personalized learning, the kind of learning where you self-organize your curriculum. You figure out what it is you're going to do. I was listening to the speaker before me in the back and how she was talking about doing that very thing, where we personalize and self-organize the kinds of learning experiences. I grew up in a very mobile environment, and so because of that, we didn't have a lot of books. You can't move them quickly, and we didn't have a lot of learning materials. And so my sister saw that I basically thought of education as something contrived, sim simulated, that happened in school, and when I came home, all I did was mindless kinds of things. And so what she did is she said, I'm going to find out your interests, your passions, and then once I find out your interests, I'm going to give you rich, beautiful materials, artwork videos, books to read. And what I found is that I became hungry. She personalized the learning around my passions, my interests, still with certain objectives to obtain that she held, but because of that, when interest drove the learning, I went deeper. And because I went deeper, cognitive psychology tells us that anytime you go deep in learning, you're going to elaborate. And when you elaborate around what you're learning, when you transparently share around what you're learning, it allows deep um, storage and easy retrieval. It'll work, it worked for me. It worked for my students. It's going to work for your colleagues and for your students as well. See, Future ready leaders will leverage this idea of personalized learning around your curriculum map. So whatever you've got going on in your school, that is the curriculum mapping that you use. But you personalize the curriculum around that, and you give students not choice in what they're going to learn, but you give them choices in how they're going to learn it and how they're going to show mastery to you. And that's where we're personalizing the curriculum. I love this. Howard Rheingold wrote a book called Smart Mobs. And in this book, he talked about something that I think is so powerful. You know how most of you got into your leadership positions, or either as a teacher leader leading from your place of practice, by being great content experts. You know your stuff. If I, the one that I was telling somebody backstage, I really identify with independent schools. I got my start in independent school, Valwood in Valdosta, Georgia. But I, I really identify with them most is because they will embrace scholarship. They don't mind talking about and being deeply reflective. And so when most of us got our start there, we kind of pride ourselves. And some of us in our classrooms will even deliver content and not really think about the relationships and the personalizing of curriculum. Well, what Howard says is he says that is a 20th century mindset, that it's not about what you know. And this shift started to happen towards the end of the 20th century where it became who you know. How many of your parents told you growing up, hey, it's not what you know, it's who you know. Get out there and make those connections. We're going to send you to the right school. You're going to go to the right retirement parties. You're going to make those connections. You're going to pass out business cards wherever you go. Howard says, nope. That's not where we're at now. But if you truly want to be successful in the 21st century, it's not what you know, it's not who you know, it's do you know what who you know knows. I'll say that one more time. It's do you know what who you know knows. And as a, as a future-ready leader, do you know how to leverage this? 
Are you in charge of your own personal learning? Because you know, you can't give it away until you own it first, right? So you have to personalize your own learning from a distributive model and a connected model, and you really have to be selfish about that. You have to think about what is it that I need to learn to create this legacy-minded, future-ready vision, and then you need to allow yourself to spend the time connecting with people globally to get ideas, to come back and co-construct, co-design, and give the best of what you've harvested online to others in your school to inform the work and the practice that you're in charge of. You building a network isn't really all about you. It's about the value add that you're going to bring back to the schools and the work and the children that you serve. Do you know what who you know knows and can you leverage it? So legacy leadership, if we take, if we take future ready mindset and we look at it, okay, well, how does this inform teaching? The way that it informs teaching is that you're not delivering content anymore. What you're doing is you're, you see your role as a teacher and you, some of you as an instructional leader that's going to be help guiding that process with teacher leaders, you see your role as helping children find their passions, helping them to build understanding, helping others to be able to find your best pedagogy online and their best learning online, helping them to find subject matter experts and engage and to find their voice both online and offline. You have to become a learner first and a leader second. You have to be a learner first and an educator second so that, you're, that you are continuously learning and you're learning collaboratively. You're co-constructing, you're co-designing, you're co-reflecting with the, with the folks that are in your leadership and under what you're doing, whether that's the classroom or that's in a much more formal learn, leadership capacity. The third pillar, if you will, or structure, bucket, domain of future ready leadership is this idea of robust infrastructure. So some of you may say, oh yeah, yeah, I don't have to worry about that. We have a tech coordinator, we have a CIO, we have somebody that's going to handle all that. If, you are, if your legacy-minded future ready leadership vision is going to be leading digital conversion or transformation in your area of influence, then you have to be informed about this and think about it. So as you're connecting and collaborating and you've got these kids doing what they're doing, is there enough connectivity and capacity? Do you have at least a gig of pipe that's running that's going to be able to support the kinds of engagement and interaction that you're doing? What about digital devices? Have you thought about the kinds of devices that you're going to put in everybody's hand? And are you just choosing it because it was the best deal? Are you just choosing it because such and such school is using that so we will too? Or have you got a clear-cut plan for what it is you want to accomplish, and then you choose the right tool for the task? All right. Also thinking in terms of software and systems for teaching and learning. Are you out there? Are you knowing the kinds of things that you need to do? You know, when we're thinking about personalized learning, there's response system software now. So you can have these kids working on these projects, working on these groups, self-organizing their learning, and then what happens is if they're working with software as they're collecting their data and they're putting their uh, information together for you to see, you, it will actually show the time that they spend on certain things, where they struggle, the kinds of things they, they need to do, and it scores that for you. So it isn't like you have to go back and recreate the wheel. The software now is very responsive. And a lot of, of the systems and softwares that are out there, when you go to your uh, vendors, you're going to find are very much supportive of this shift in education and where we're moving. Think about personal, personalized learning and, and privacy issues with uh, d data systems, and, and that's huge. Also, technology personnel. This is something that usually cracks me up. And that's why I think it's such an important part of robust infrastructure. People will say, well, who are you going to hire for those technology positions? Well, you're going to hire the resident geek, right? The guy who knows a lot about that kind of stuff? No. You don't want somebody who's geek-minded. You want somebody who's growth-minded. You want to hire technology personnel that understand that they are there to serve the learning, not the, not the network. And then you also want people that when you're hiring those technology personnel to have enough people per devices, enough people per um, infrastructure, and then out of school access. You know, I was talking to Barbara last night, and one of the things that she was talking about is the shift that she's seeing in independent schools around this idea of diversity and multiculturalism and how important that is in the schools in which you lead and teach. And I, I was thinking, so when that happens, when you have that shift, how are you going to handle out of school access? Not everybody's going to have it like you're used to in the past, and you're going to have some, you're going to need to have a plan in place for that. Future ready leaders think about those kinds of things. 
So let's think about professional learning opportunities. How do we handle professional learning opportunities? Thinking in terms of there's a shift from professional development that's actually done to you, where you come to an in-service, an outside expert is brought in, they put on that little lab coat so they look like they know what they're talking about, right? And then they do that professional development to you. So it's kind of like I hate the word empowered because it tends to suggest that we have power to give when really you're enabling people to become empowered themselves. And I think often when we use the term professional development, it has the same context to it. It's something I do to you, kind of like I'm doing right now, right? Instead, professional learning opportunities where teachers teach teachers. It's kind of like sheep have sheep, sheep beget sheep, right? Teachers teach teachers. And so one of the superintendents on my tour said, what we do in this area is micro-credentialing. Have any of you ever heard of micro-credentialing? It's awesome. It actually, the idea came out of digital promise. And so if you want to Google digital promise and micro-credentialing. And what it is, is where you allow the educators to decide what is it that you want to learn? What is it that's important to you in the work that you're going to accomplish? How is this going to best serve what you're trying to bring about? Not that standardized agenda, but the growth that you want to have to self-actualize as an educator. And then once they decide that, either individuals or teams of people come together and they decide what they want to learn, then they create this path. And they come to you and they say, okay, here's how we're going to do it. This is how we're going to learn it. And the learning can happen in formal, the kinds of things you're used to with courses or classes, university, or it can happen in very informal, messy places like ed camps, unconferences, webinars, online communities of practice. They said how you learn it doesn't matter. What matters is what you do with it when you bring it back. And so then you have to develop a plan on how you're going to implement, how you're going to test it out, if it's in the classroom with your students, how you're going to be reflective about that and come back. In one case that she shared, there was a group of 40 that worked on this micro-credential together. And what they decided to do is they attended all these ed camps and these unconferences. And if you don't know what that is, they're awesome. They really allow you to be self learners and the way that they're designed and approached. And so they took that information and they came back and did a remix with the culture of their school. That's why all this is generalizable. You know, I might be telling you stories from public school, and some of you might have cut me off at that point, but, but Future Ready leaders have an open understanding that you can generalize this into your culture, because each one of your independent schools are very different from the others. And so by thinking through how can we remix these ideas, and then that group of 40 implemented it, and the, the, the benefit of that, when you earn a micro-credential, then you actually are able to um, get a pay raise. So it affects your bottom line. Okay? So professional learning opportunities, thinking about how can we allow uh, our teachers, our faculty, our leaders to be in charge of their own professional learning. I'm going to close with a story from Steve Webb. Now, Steve Webb is uh, one of the superintendents that were on this nine districts in 27 days while that I went on to capture the video. And when he was doing his robust infrastructure plan, he decided that the way that he was going to roll out the digital devices wasn't traditional. You know, most people will start with a grade band. Maybe they'll pilot it in the sixth grade, and then they add a grade each year. They do something like that. What he said is, in our school, the culture is such, my future leadership vision is around equity. I want to give all students voice. So he started with the most marginalized populations in his district, special needs kids. And he tells this beautiful story of Austin, who's given this device, this iPad, and he's got a communication disorder. Austin has not spoken since birth. His parents have never heard him talk. They've heard him scream and grunt and, you know, whine, but they've never heard verbalization, and his teacher has never heard it. And all of a sudden, with this device in hand, Austin quickly texts out a message where it went text to speech. And what did he say? His teachers turned. She's doing this on the board. And then all of a sudden, he says, I would like a cracker, please. And his teacher turns, and, she, you know, it's Austin. She knew it had to be. It was, it was computer generated. And she says, Austin, it isn't snack time. We'll be doing snacks in just a little bit. And we're going to finish the lesson here. And he said, but they taste so good. You know, what a great legacy that Steve has left to reach all and give everyone voice, which will live on long after he's gone. So what will your legacy be? I got to know, what will your legacy be? If, you were, if I was to challenge you to tell me in 60 seconds or less what your future-ready vision is 
for how you're going to change the places that you lead from, your sphere of influence, could you do it? Better yet, let's not do that. Let's do 140 characters. Either now if you have it ready, or sometime today as you go through the other speakers, I want you to tweet out a 140 character sentence. You know, you can define a man if you can put it in one sentence, right? And then use the tech ed advice hashtag so that I can and can retweet as you tell, share with the world your vision for future ready. You can do this. You can. You're wildly creative. You're successful. You have what it takes. You're not a manager. You're a leader. You are an inspirational leader. This is my hope for you. If you went into education because you wanted to make a difference, then yay for you. But what I'm hoping is that through your future ready vision, that you won't make a difference, you'll be the difference. Thank you so much for having me.